Welcome to Morning Worship. We're glad you're here with the Clinton Alliance Church. If you're visiting for the first time, welcome. And uh, what a beautiful, beautiful resurrection day we have outside today. We had 11 people up on the hill this morning for uh, sunrise service. Even the turkeys <laughs> were chattering with the, with the good news that Jesus is alive. Amen. So uh, let's have our call to worship this morning with a beautiful hymn from 1997, Before the Throne of God Above. Easter Sunday service. We're all glad you're here. And uh, I'm going to do a little, the scripture reading this morning is going to be in Luke 24. It's a little review of what we had this morning at sunrise service. I thought it was good. So whoever makes sunrise service, you get almost the same pitch from me. <laughs> Anyways, it's uh, Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone and rolled it rolled away from the tomb, and when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. And the thing we should remember is too, not to look for Christ among the dead as many documentaries do and 
to pick them as, you know, trying to find them. He's here alive in all of us, you, I, all of us. We are to emulate him while we're here on this earth. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and raising this day, giving us hope in the life to come after this world. But yes, this, and, and you bless this day for all of us in your holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Let's stand for worship this morning. Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's sing together. remain standing for worship.
be seated. Good morning. Ah, the wonder working power. Why would you look for the living among the dead? One of my favorite scripture lines just shows that angels have a sense of humor. Why would you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. Early on the first day of the week. We're going to have coffee and food fellowship right after this across the street. So if you're with us for the first time today, do, uh, do join us over there. There's a little extra setup down there. I saw the tables with tablecloths. Everything looks beautiful. So all the hospitality folks uh, have really done a nice job down there. Uh, Sunday night gathering tonight is canceled uh, due to the uh, holiday weekend. The Amen, which is the um, men's fellowship in our church, they meet the first Saturday of each month, and they'll be meeting this coming Saturday right across the street, Youth Center, 7 a.m. Rich Biot is the uh, head person on that. Also, Potluck Sunday is next Sunday. So if you're here today, come on back next Sunday and bring something to share. The first Sunday of the month is communion, and the first Sunday of the month is potluck, so uh, we'll have a uh, we'll have a big celebration next week, first uh, first Sunday in April, here already, so hallelujah. Well, good to see you all today. And uh, as Pastor uh, gets ready to come, we're going to sing um, another song called "Because He Lives." We sang "Because He Lives" last week, but this is uh, Matt uh, Mayer's uh, song. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Amen. <clears throat>
We, uh, we don't have uh, Junior Church today, but we do have um, the foyer down below. There are some young folks gathering there. We have the nursery across the street. And uh, good morning, Pastor. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yeah, we thought we'd give our kids workers the Sunday off. And so there are those options. There's also the mother's room up there, which I call the aquarium. And, uh, and so if that's needed, enjoy. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here this morning. And uh, let's just open a word of prayer. Father, Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful sunny day. We thank you for family and friends and those who've gathered here in this place. Uh, Lord, many know you. Some don't. Some are curious. Some aren't. Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to hearts and minds this day to each person in their own way, that they would leave here feeling as if, Lord, you tapped them on the shoulder or you whispered in their ear. I pray that that might be the case. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, Joe Malafi read a portion of scripture for you this morning and about the resurrection of Christ. And followers of Christ believe this to be true. The majority of the world does not. Okay? In the early 60s, a college textbook on world religions was written by Houston Smith. It became a required reading for any student curious enough to sign up for the course. And in the course of time, millions upon millions of students did. In the final chapter of the book, Houston concluded three possibilities about the world's religions. First, he said that one of the world's religions is superior to the others. Number two, that the religions of the world are all basically alike. The third choice, which seemed to be Houston's preference, and slightly more poetic than the first two, reads this way. A third conception of the way religions are, relate, are related likens us, well, likens them to a stained glass window whose sections divide the light of the sun this analogy allows for significant differences between religions without pronouncing on their relative worth. His idea was that God was behind the stained glass window, shining bright, and, and yet we perceive him in different colors and different ways. Again, poetic. But I think Smith's fondness for the third possibility reflects two things. His dislike for the first and that was that one was superior to the others, and his inability to defend the second, which was to say they were all the same. Now, if you study them closely, all three statements, in fact, the third choice is really just the second choice reconfigured, and it represents a pluralistic view of religion. So wh what is pluralism? That's a big word that most of us are probably not familiar with, but it's really not that tough. Plural is more than one. Right? Pluralism is simply this. Religious pluralism believes that all religions are equal value and validity. It's all good. Confucianism, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Islam, it's all good. It's all the same. Now, the appeal of this philosophy or this idea in American society is obvious. Tolerance has taken on a new meaning, and inclusiveness has become our culture's greatest concern, while exclusiveness has in turn become America's darkest sin. We all want to be on the same page, and if we're not on the same page, then we're doing something wrong. That's what our culture insinuates now. Let me explain. According to Webster's Dictionary, tolerance means this to neither forbid nor prevent, to recognize and respect the rights and opinions or practices of others, to put up with them or endure them, okay? To put up with them or to endure them. Now, what does that mean? 
And this is, this is the definition of tolerance, the traditional definition of tolerance. It means that if I'm a Red Sox fan, I should neither forbid nor prevent others from rooting for or supporting the Yankees. Okay? That sounds reasonable. That's magnanimous. If I'm a Democrat, I should recognize and respect the rights and the opinions of Republicans. This is a proper understanding of tolerance. We put up with each other. We agree to disagree, which works pretty darn well. That's not a bad idea. However, in today's culture, tolerance has been defined a different way. And it means approval. And that's very different. Tolerance is not approving. Tolerance is not accepting or agreeing with somebody else, somebody else's choice or their behavior. Let me explain again. If I'm a Red Sox fan, I don't have to agree with anyone who thinks the Yankees are the best team in the world. I can say, Pfft. okay, I can disagree. If I'm a Democrat, I don't have to agree with a Republican or vote for one. America allows me to do that. I can disagree. And you can disagree. I get an amen? Amen. amen. We can disagree. Why? Well, because I disagree, and, and the last time I checked, disagreeing or having another opinion is not a sin, nor is it an infraction of civil law. You can disagree. Disagreeing doesn't make a person a racist, a hater, or a bigot, nor do people who disagree have a phobia or any other psychological problem. They just disagree. <clears throat> and that's okay with most people. But the problem is, in today's culture, there's a growing number of people who frown on those who disagree and question those who disagree and criticize those who disagree and would ostracize those who disagree. Today, people are expected to agree with pretty much everything and everyone who is embraced by the popular culture. The popular culture said it's cool. We need to go with it. Not just tolerate it, not just respect it, not just put up with it, but approve it. There's a difference. There's a difference. With social norms changing almost daily, and the meaning of the word tolerance having been changed to agree or comply, people who embrace the Christian faith find themselves at odds with more and more of their neighbors. Neighbors were called to love and to reach with the good news of the gospel. Okay? But they're a little dismayed at us because we don't agree with everything and everybody. The issue called into question <clears throat> is truth. In today's inclusive culture, uh, truth is only seen as an opinion. To those who follow Christ, truth is God's and God's alone. Which brings us back to Houston's three observations about how we view religion. Um, nowhere in any of his statements does the word truth ever arise. It's never used. He ne doesn't use the word truth when he references religions. See, the question is, the question is, not which religion is superior, but which religion is true. Do we determine the truth? Do we as human beings determine the truth? Or does God? Jesus said this. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. To Pilate, who interrogated him, Jesus said this. He said, I was born, came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now, these are two very exclusive statements about the nature of truth. Statements that are unacceptable to the vast majority of Americans today. 
Jesus is not saying that all religions are the same, or that they all reveal the same thing, or that they all show the same way to God. Jesus is saying, I do. I do. And quite frankly, that was not all that popular in those days, and it's, it's not at all popular today. I do. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Dr. John Lennox, a born-again Christian, professor of Oxford University, holds some pretty heavy-duty formal educational degrees. He observes that most people live in a globalized society. That's what America is becoming. Whose citizens are adherents of plurality of religions or none at all. In other words, more and more we're becoming a culture that believes that all religions are the same, or we believe in no religion at all. We're just simply atheistic. Say so the whole thing is ridiculous. Okay? Now, I think this is a fairly accurate description of American culture today. A hundred years ago, you might have described our country as being predominantly Christian, but that label no longer fits. No longer fits. We are not a Christian nation. Now, some people would disagree with me. Now, I'd be happy to talk with you about that if you make an appointment and meet me in my office, but Sunday morning on Easter is not the time. In the early and mid-60s, our culture shifted its focus to other major religions in the world, particularly those of an Eastern persuasion. This coupled with the desire to be inclusive, politically correct, tolerant to the point of agreeing and approving with other religions created a decidedly pluralistic understanding of all religions here in America and in many places around the world. Dr. Lennox observed, religious pluralism argues and claims to absolute truth are a hindrance to peace and harmony. Let me read it again. Religious pluralism argues that claims to religious, to, to absolute truth, are a hindrance to peace and harmony. It's dangerous that we should say we understand what is true, and we know it absolutely. And herein lies the problem for the devout Christian. For the Christ, the Son of the living God, whose resurrection we celebrate on Easter Sunday on this day, claimed the truth as his own. As we've already seen, that's what Jesus did. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I'm a truth, but the truth. Not one of many ways, but the only way. Again, am amazingly exclusive. According to Lennox, many in our world see such a statement as dangerous and even a threat to peace. That's how the Romans saw him, and that's why they killed him. That's how the Jews saw him, and that's why they killed him. If he was here today, he made such a claim, they would kill him again. But he has a funny way of showing up again. <laughs> Jesus' words to Pilate were emphatic. Jesus looked at Pilate, formerly schooled, intellectual Roman, no slouch, smart guy. Jesus looked him in the eye and he said, everybody on the side of the truth listens to me. And that was utterly unacceptable to Pilate. The Bible, the Bible says he feared Jesus, but he didn't understand him. Religious pluralists struggle with statements such as these, fearing that they would lead to extremism. Pluralist Karl Popper explains. He says, belief that one possesses the truth is always implicitly totalitarian. Okay? What's, what he's suggesting is, is that if a group of people believe they possess the truth exclusively, it is only a matter of time before those people demand obedience from everybody else. Obedience to what they perceive to be the truth. And so to protect free society, we must reject 
any claim of absolute truth, suggesting that we as Christians might ultimately go to war against everybody else because we've got the truth and they don't have the truth and we want them to have the truth and so we're going to ram it down their throats. And I don't think that's a fair assumption. When Pilate examined Jesus, Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. Otherwise, my disciples would fight. Otherwise, my disciples would fight. But they didn't, didn't they? They stepped aside. They let it happen. What happened when Peter drew his sword? Jesus took it away from him. He said, no, this is not how it's going to be. We're pitching an idea. We're not going to ram it down anybody's throat. People will accept this or they will reject this according to their own will, their own volition, their own choice. Jesus comes into the world, says, love God, love each other. It'll all work out. The world says, no, we're really not interested. And so some in the secular world see absolute truth as a threat to peace. Now others, like Gordon Kaufman, another pluralist, uh, simply sees religion as silly. He says religions are culturally conditioned simply creations of the human imagination. He just thinks, you know, just, it's ridiculous. The whole idea is ridiculous. For these reasons and others, scholars like Popper and Kaufman feel that people ought to give up their claim to any final truth for the good of humankind in general, you know. But we who believe dare not give up on this world uh, and the, or the people in this world regardless of how dangerous intellectuals think we are or how silly they think we are. Again, the intellectuals of the world see us as, as dangerous because we say, no, we've got the truth. We've got the truth. We want to share the truth with somebody. The truth will set you free. The truth liberated me. The truth gave me peace. The truth made me happy. The truth fills my life and fills my mind. We want to give it to somebody else. Oh, no, if you do it, you're dangerous. You're dangerous. Or you're just silly. You're just, you're just silly. You're just deceived. You're naive. You're not thinking. You're not as smart as we are. Okay? Lastly, I'd like to address Houston Smith's claim that all religions point to the same God. All religions point to the same God. Uh, in a nutshell, this idea is neither logical nor defendable. Aristotle said this. He said, nothing can be and not be in the same respect. Nothing can be and not be in the same respect. And again, I apologize. It's early on a Sunday morning, and philosophy is a little much. But just bear with me. What does this mean? Two ideas that contradict each other cannot be the same. They cannot both be right. World religions reveal certain similarities but it doesn't make them the same. In fact, most major world religions contradict each other considerably. And this is why many in the intellectual world don't believe in absolute truth. But we as believers do. We do. We believe what Joe Malafi read this morning. We believe what Jesus said and what is recorded in the Bible. Christians view God's truth as having been revealed by the Hebrews, and then the Christians. This truth's foundation reaches back to creation itself, the time of Adam and Eve. Other religions borrowed bits and pieces from God's truth in the course of time, but none of these religions bear the marks of the original. Christianity does. The rest are at best incomplete. That's why they contradict the Bible and each other. That's why they can't all be right, as Houston Smith suggests. Few people, if any, believe that two incompatible opinions on any topic are both right. Most people see one opinion as right and the other as wrong. Isn't that how you see it? One's right, one's wrong. I mean, occasionally we run into something where there's a gray area, and we might ponder that gray area. But... For the big stuff, you know, if I, if I say, okay, let's take a vote. Murder. How many see that as wrong? 
come on, I need to see more hands than that. You know, hey, yeah, just, girl, hey, wait a minute, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. We get that. To say that two clearly conflicting ideas are both right simply doesn't make sense. And that's what Aristotle is saying. That's what he's saying. You can't have two contradictory ideas and they both be right. Houston Smith says, oh yeah, 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 yeah that works out. I'm going to take Aristotle's side over Houston Smith. And what about those who say, you can't know the truth? Well, you can't know the truth. How, who do you think you are that you know the truth? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I believe him. So if Jesus knows the truth, and if he told me the truth, I know the truth. Okay? But people say, you can't know the truth. Francis Schaeffer, another pretty sharp guy, offered a simple answer. He said this. He says, to declare absolute truth and impossibility, a person must first assume an absolute truth about absolute truth. Now, I'll repeat it, but it won't help. <laughs> okay? Now, pay attention. To declare absolute truth is an impossibility, a person must first assume that absolute truth about absolute truth. They're saying it is the absolute truth that you cannot know absolute truth. You poor, stupid, deprived, messed up, deranged, childish, immature Christian. What are they saying? They're saying I'm, it's absolutely true that you cannot know absolute truth. That's what they're saying. It's absolutely true that you cannot know absolute truth. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Let's back up the philosophical and logical train. You can't say that. And to think that doesn't make sense. What does it mean? It means that many skeptics believe it is the absolute truth that absolute truth cannot be known, logically shooting themselves in the foot. The argument doesn't hold water. It all comes upon. You can't say, logically, I know for a fact you can't know truth. You with me? Hang in there. So in the end, what does the logic of Aristotle and Schaefer and even Lennox, to a lesser sense, tell us? These ideas tell us it is illogical to believe that clearly contradictory religions are all equally true. What Houston said is illogical. They tell us it is illogical to say you cannot know the truth because when you say this, you're assuming your statement is true. How can you know anything if you can't know the truth? How can we know anything if we can't know the truth? When I was a child, my six brothers and sisters and I would often believe wrong things. <laughs> and then we would make emphatic statements based on those beliefs, thinking we were right. You ever see a kid that kind of put their feet down on the planet and say, this is how it works. And <laughs> you don't know which way is up. Okay? Little children often do this because they're little children. They don't have a great understanding. Okay? When my father heard us do this, my, when my father heard us say such things, he would furrow his brow, kind of give us the stink eye. May look at us in disgust. May make a face. Something like this. And in disapproval. And then, then that awful look would kind of turn to a smile. And as he turned to walk away, he would wave his huge hand at us as he turned to walk away, and he'd say, oh, you're full of mud. And he would walk away. That was Dad's way of telling us that we didn't know what we were talking about, and he was right. You're full of mud. People who believe that all religions are the same, people who believe that the truth about God cannot be known, 
don't know what they're talking about. Their arguments to support their beliefs don't hold water because they are clearly illogical, as I've endeavored to show you this morning in a very brief presentation. No matter how many PhDs they have, no matter how convincing they sound, they're still wrong. There are hundreds of reasons to believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that the biblical account is true. Those reasons, now listen, those reasons have stood the test of time, the scrutiny of skeptics, and endless attacks of atheistic authors who have dedicated their lives and their very existence to disproving, disproving the biblical account, only to fail time and time again. The collective intellectual community of atheists has worked very hard. Their efforts, admirable. Their intellect, impressive. But they've never proved it wrong. They never proved it wrong. They fail because they're full of mud. <laughs> now, don't tell them that. And don't tell them that I said that. Instead, we have to show grace. We have to listen to them. We have to try to answer their questions. We should befriend them. We should be patient. We should tolerate them. We should put up with them. We should show respect for them and for their opinion and try to help them understand ours better. And above all, we, we need to love them. We need to love them because they're in the dark. They don't get it. And they're in terrible danger. And we, you have the answer. If you believe, as I do, that what happened on that first Easter Sunday really did happen, you owe it to those who doubt the story, your very best efforts to help them figure it out. That's our job. That's what the church is supposed to do. Wow, I'm done almost 10 minutes early. John wrote this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. You're here, and you, you may not buy into all this, but, and what I tried to do this morning is, for those of you who don't buy into all this, I was trying to just convince you, it's not as ridiculous and crazy as it might first seem that there are good, solid, intellectual reasons for believing the resurrection of Christ. Then there's that other thing, hope. Hope that belongs to every last one of us. Most of us, whether we would admit it or not, all hope that there's something more than this. And the older we get, the more we hope for it. And the closer we get to death, the more we hope for it. We may have been very skeptical about the whole God and the whole love thing all of our lives, but as we get to the end of the show, we begin to count our lives in months and even weeks. The whole idea of God becomes more interesting because there's hope in you. There's hope in you. Where did it come from? I think it came from God. I think God put hope in all of us. Even you died in the wool kind of ornery, atheistic skeptics. God love you. And if you're here today, I'm glad you're here. Because he put something in you you can't get rid of. And that's hope. Hope. Exclusively human. A wonderful thing that points us to the possibilities of something more. The possibilities of God. The possibilities of heaven. Possibilities. Okay? I should score some big points for letting you go early. Let's pray. We'll let you do that before I ramble on another 10 minutes. Father, Lord, God, bless these people. Encourage their hearts and minds, and particularly those who ponder these things and who wonder about you, who are not sure. And for those who do know you, dear Lord, I pray that you would build their faith and their confidence. We thank you, dear Lord, for the possibilities put before us by your Son, Jesus the Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning.